I'm NASA astronaut Victor Glover. Thank you, Ambassador Cindy McCain, and thank you, Rick Davis, and to all of the folks at the McCain Institute who have made this forum possible. It is a privilege to join you this morning, but I wish I could be there with you in person for this great panel. And as you prepare to continue your dialogue about great power competition, I'd like to give you some ideas to think about. My astronaut career actually began in John McCain's personal Senate office. It was about nine years ago when I had the privilege of letting him know that I had been selected for astronaut candidate training. I went into his office and I told him that I had good news and I had bad news. The good news is I was selected to be a NASA astronaut. And the bad news is I would have to leave your office early. And so we actually had a really great conversation that day. And one of the things that he said to me has stuck with me since then. It was to go to NASA and to help them reestablish our ability to launch astronauts from American soil. And that made it really special to be a part of Crew-1, the first operational mission of a new spacecraft, the Crew Dragon, which we named ours Resilience. And that mission went to the International Space Station for 168 days, where we were able to conduct hundreds of scientific experiments, a majority of which were centered around how human spaceflight and extended periods away from Earth affect the human body. We conducted five spacewalks, four of which I was able to go out into the vacuum of space. And we spent lots of time taking pictures and observing the Earth, our beautiful home planet. The International Space Station is a testament to what human beings are capable of when we work together. It is the efforts of 15 partner nations and several space agencies that resulted in that amazing orbiting laboratory, manufacturing facility, outreach facility, and scientific outpost in low Earth orbit. As I like to call it, that castle in the sky. And now we stand at the precipice of our Artemis program, which is going to take humanity back to the moon, but this time to stay. And I'll leave you with this saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. So as you continue to dialogue about great power competition, I would encourage you to think about how to balance competition with the power of cooperation. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Well, good morning. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. I'm Chris Davenport of The Washington Post, and it's a real pleasure to be here. I uh, want to say thanks to uh, the Sedona Forum and everyone at the McCain Institute for putting this on. It's, it's a real honor uh, to be here. Um, and I, I will say that I have the best beat, as we call it, at the Washington Post. Being the space reporter at the Washington Post, I know we've got you know, a couple other reporters here, and they may tell you the same thing, but they're wrong. I have the best job. Forget the White House covering space right now. It's such an interesting time. As we saw Victor Glover giving that introduction, he may well be on the next moon mission. That is someone who may walk on the moon. That's what's going on right now. It's such an exciting time. SpaceX, Blue Origin in the commercial sector, the Artemis program, constellations of satellites going up. And we've got such a great uh, panel to talk about that. And I thought I would just open it up uh, to each of you to talk about what you think is the most significant thing going on in space right now. What are you excited about? What are the challenges? You know, what is the path forward? Well, I'll, uh, I'll start by saying, first of all, good morning, everybody. Great to be here in Sedona. Thank you, Cindy and the McCain Institute for the invitation and putting on this great conference. Um, you know, since we started at NASA this concept of uh, commercial crew. This was during the Obama administration and commercial car cargo uh, to the International Space Station. We have brought down as a nation the cost of access to orbit significantly. Um, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, three, four, five percent. I'm talking about cutting it perhaps in half. When you look at the ability to SpaceX, for SpaceX in particular, to launch a payload, uh, and the way they are able to reuse their, uh, their rockets. Um, when uh, Elon Musk first said that he was going to fly a traditional rocket and land it vertically on the launch pad, I thought he was nuts. Like, I did not think 
that the uh, physics supports that and the rocket equation, which is, you know, has to do with the thrust and mass and what you can lift to, to orbit would support actually bringing it back, landing it vertically uh, and reusing it. And I would say that uh, one of the big wins for our country was uh, the decision to give companies like SpaceX and others uh, some help, some government resources, and then sort of leave them alone to innovate. Uh, nothing against our partners out there like Boeing and Lockheed Martin and the other big contractors, but I would imagine if a CEO of a very large aerospace company would have went into work one day and said, hey, you know, I'd like you guys to figure out how to land our rocket vertically on the launch pad and then refly it again, you know, just maybe a couple months later, that we would have, you would have seen a response from the, from the engineers and the team to the CEO, hey, that's not going to work. I mean, we're not going to be able to figure that out. Um, but with, these, with this startup mentality and this incredible innovation that we have uh, from certain areas of our country, there are people that just don't take no for an answer. And I want to give, you know, and full disclosure here, I used to do a little consulting for SpaceX, so full disclosure. But I want to give them a lot of credit and, and other companies for just really trying to do hard things that is the one thing that we do as a country better than anybody else, to try to solve hard problems, and they did that. And that's what we're seeing right now in, in space. I would compare today in space to what we saw in aviation in the 1930s. So in the 1930s, what happened? Well, in the 1930s, a company called Douglas built an airplane that could carry people without killing them, very often, <laughs> could maintain the aircraft and could make a little bit of money doing it. And the airplane they built was called the DC-3. And that caused aviation to just, well, I don't want to use the word explode. That's generally not a good word <laughs> in this business, but really take off. And we're seeing that in space today. Yeah. Congressman Waltz. Yeah, hey, thanks. Uh, Mike Waltz, uh, represent Northeast Florida. My district touches the northern border of uh, Cape Canaveral. Uh, and, and I too want to thank you, Cindy, and thank you for all the staff. Uh, John McCain uh, inspired me to run for office. Uh, so there's some days where I'm saying not so many nice things, but mostly uh, thanking him. And, and, and really, I still go back and actually look at some of his hearings uh, because he made it his mission to hold NASA uh, and to hold the Pentagon accountable. Um, and, and as I watch some of those hearings, I see many of the same issues, um, which is a little uh, depressing sometimes, but how he got at it, uh, you know, how prescient he was, one of those in the MD-180, the Russian engine, uh, which he put a ban on, and look how prescient uh, that was now because he forced innovation. So I agree with you, Mark. I think this is, a, this is just such a unique space in public-private partnership and where government can have a very positive influence and in instigating role, uh, John McCain being a, a leader in that, and then let's let innovation happen. Uh, in terms of your, d directly to answer your question, you know, I, I had the opportunity to being down at Cape Canaveral for the 50th anniversary for Apollo, had the opportunity to be uh, literally standing behind President Trump and Vice President Pence, who was a complete space nerd uh, and, and real advocate uh, as the Demo 2, uh, as America, for the first time in a decade, launched American astronauts on American soil in a private sector uh, uh, rocket, which was just a phenomenal experience. But what's different, particularly with the 50th anniversary of Apollo to today, is economically, we have such incredible dependencies now on space. The average person touches space nine times a day, doesn't even realize it. Our agriculture, our real-time logistics, of course our telecommunications, uh, but our military as well. Every system that comes before the Armed Services Committee now has a massive dependency on what's in space. So what I'm focused on is that our adversaries know that. Uh, our adversaries are replicating that, uh, particularly the Chinese, and they have developed the ability to hold our economy and our uh, military's ability to shoot, move, and communicate around the world at risk. And we're playing catch up. Uh, and we're playing catch up in a big way. Uh, the Chinese have gone from about 40 satellites 
uh, 12 years ago to over 400. Now a 10x increase. They are launching more than the rest of the world combined, including us. Uh, they are on, which I, uh, Mark can talk to well, uh, they are on track to put a manned station on the moon. They have put a rover on the backside of the moon, first country to ever do it, and have taken soil samples from the moon, which we haven't done since the 1970s. And they're putting up a brand new space station separate than ours while we're debating when ours is too old and how we uh, uh, keep it alive. So I'm very worried. Uh, I'll be the depressing guy here to make everybody want to drink early in the morning. Um, uh, you know, may, I think we are moving now in the right direction, but if you look at the trend lines, do we catch back up fast enough? I think the move towards Space Force was absolutely uh, the right move. Uh, it needed an equal seat at the table as the Pentagon arm wrestles for budgets. Kerry here, who was uh, for a decade on uh, the armed services, uh, the House Armed Services staff, and has forgotten more about this than I've learned and taught me a lot. So it's great to see you. But um, look, at the end of the day, General Milley's absolutely right. Two things. Uh, the first shots in every war game now are fired in space and in cyber every single time to take those capabilities out. And the second thing is if we don't catch up, we cannot continue to be number one on Earth if we're number two in space. It's just, it's just that simple. Yeah, and Kerry, you were obviously in the government uh, and at the Pentagon and now in industry. So how do you see that from both sides? Well, and I would talk about space innovation, but I hadn't done it in the private sector. So now I'm there. And I would say, despite what you saw yesterday of Netflix canceling Space Force, it is an incredibly exciting time um, to be in space right now. You know, kind of three things I'd, I'd offer here um, for why it's exciting. One is um, space technology is so much more accessible for all the reasons that the congressman and the senator just outlined. There are over 100 nations that have satellites in space. Over 100 nations, which just tells you how prolific you know, its use and our dependency is on it. Um, we are seeing the commercialization of space capabilities that until now have largely been done by governments with big government pocketbooks, resources, classified technology. So whether it's in all weather day night imagery with radar satellites, uh, satellites like what we're doing right now at Hawkeye that collect signals across the globe, um, satellites can collect hyperspectral information, on orbit servicing, human space flight. I never would have imagined that these would have been risks that the private sector would have taken. I would have thought it would have been only government. Um, so that's really exciting. And also, this information that's being collected by these satellites, it's unclassified and shareable. So what excites me now is we've largely used these capabilities for uh, national security purposes, and that's still the case, and we're seeing the commercial world really um, make an impact in Ukraine today. But it opens up this space data to so many more applications, environmental, border security, maritime security, trafficking, humanitarian uh, uh, applications. So that, that's what's really exciting now. Um, and then the third thing I'd offer is speed and STEM. You know, having come from the national security space community, I was used to multi-billion dollar satellites that took five to 10 years to build and launch. Right now, we're bringing in, uh, this private sector at large, we're bringing in just incredible young talent that are putting hands-on hardware, developing code that, for satellites that are launching every three to six months. I mean, there are some companies that are pumping out satellites, six, seven satellites a day off their production line. And that's just exciting what these young folks are able to get their hands on and do. All right, so with the growth of this commercial technology, I mean, I think that first question was a little bit of a softball, but now I want to open up what's probably a can of worms. Uh, and I do want to mention before we do that that I, we are going to take some questions from the audience, so please get the wheels turning. We'll save a few minutes for that. Um, but with the growth of this commercial sector and all the capability you have, and we see this playing out in Ukraine where there's this commercial satellite imagery that the government of Ukraine has been saying, we need this because it provides us with intelligence. You have eyes on Russia. You have eyes on the destruction in Ukraine. But what happens if a US company that is providing actionable intelligence, arguably, to a foreign nation, are they then a legitimate target in an armed conflict? If they are targeted, what does the US do? Uh, what, is our, what should our response be, Senator Kelly? Well, let me start by saying that the, uh, the capabilities that I see from these commercial companies are, well, I, I remember being uh, right before Operation Des Desert Storm, 
couple days before we started, I was looking at some targets in, uh, at Basra Airfield that I was going to bomb. And we're down in the intel spaces, and we're looking at satellite imagery from our spy satellites. You know, this is TS, SCI imagery, and we're looking at these, well, we're hangars that I was going to drop some, some bombs on on the first night of Desert Storm. And I, I think back to that imagery, and then I see what we have commercial off the shelf now. And the stuff you can buy on the internet today from a commercial company is so much better than what I had in 1991 in trying to figure, you know, figure out the, the, the battle space and, and do some um, you know, weaponeering. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I think some of these companies are certainly um, at risk. I wouldn't be too worried if I was them about you know, the Russians targeting their satellite in space. They did a, you know, an anti-satellite test recently. But that is, uh, you know, that, that, that test is just like very well choreographed and produced to get a certain outcome. I wouldn't say right now the Russians in particular have a uh, anti-satellite capability that I would be too worried about. Now, from the cyber perspective, you know, that's where they could, they could be significantly impacted. Um, you know, I, th I think we all are still trying to figure out why we haven't seen the, the cyber response from Russia that we've expected, and I think we'll be talking about this for, you know, possibly for years. But I imagine these companies are, are somewhat at risk uh, because they are providing a very, very valuable service to the Ukrainian armed forces. Yeah, and these are images that once were classified, but now are on the front page of the Washington Post and, and on CNN. Congressman, what do you, well, do you have any thoughts on that? Look, you know, two thoughts there. One, you know, I, I wouldn't make two, uh, we have to make some distinctions, but if we had a civilian merchant ship, for example, that was attacked uh, versus a civilian satellite, um, but a civilian unmanned drone versus a civilian satellite. So right, you know, what kind of casualties were caused and therefore what our response. But I think the, the bigger issue is we don't have clear rules of the road uh, really established. We have uh, to a much greater degree with the Russians uh, over the decades, but with the Chinese, we're not even having the conversation. So for example, uh, our nuclear command and control satellites, uh, if if a, if a uh, adversary satellite gets too close or we see something heading in that direction or if we have blending as some of our uh, adversaries do between their military functions and their civilian functions, uh, where are those red lines? Uh, have they been clearly communicated? And uh, you know, are, they, are they acknowledged uh, by the other side? Uh, one of the things that we're doing to get at that is Historically, we've had these massive battleship-sized satellites. It was basically, hey, everyone, we're only going to get one of these launched every five years or every 10 years, so load it up. So you have one satellite that can do 30 things. Well, now we're going to an architecture of let's have 30 satellites that do one thing so that uh, if you take one out, no big deal. Coupled with the rapid launch, we just get another one up and we still save the other 29. So that distributed architecture with redundancy is really important and it's something the Space Force is, is, uh, is, is really focused on. I'm just worried we don't get there fast enough um, before we have some type of conflict. Well, and so, so Kerry, we have seen in the Russian conflict, Viasat uh, was hacked. I think there was a cyber intrusion from Russia. Uh, Elon Musk has talked about intrusions on the Starlink satellites, which provide the internet service. So I wonder from the industry standpoint, how, much, how big of an issue is this? Is this something that you and your colleagues are talking about? Is it something that comes up at, at Hawkeye? And is there an increased urgency given the conflicts that are going on? Well, I, I, I take a step back and just observe the Russians, they've realized how in, important space is to war fighting. So it is not a coincidence that there were cyber uh, attacks against Viasad, that Starlink was jammed, that GPS is jammed, because they know that space provides that precision navigation, precision weapons, communications, um, um, intelligence support. So they went after it early. Um, but what I would say is, um, and so the, you know, the, there are, this is where the commercial sector and this innovation um, sector is just so great because you know, Starlink, it was reported 
hey, we were getting jammed. We put our engineers on this, and well, a couple days, two weeks later, you know, we worked around it. Um, we've been detecting interference of GPS um, over Ukraine. Um, and we went back after working with some of our, our customers, and in two to three weeks, made a change to what we were doing to better uh, identify those sources of interference. So what's happening now is, is great. The other thing I'd say is, you know, for U the U.S. private sector new space companies, and, and we talk a lot amongst ourselves, there isn't one that hasn't surged to help support the fight. Mm. So you know, I get it, There's, there are threats out there, and, and, and the policy question that you raise is a very good one, but these companies, these 22, 25 year olds, they wanna do something meaningful. And this is meaningful, impactful work, and they're gonna work nights and weekends to support it. Senator Kelly, you mentioned the, the Russian ASAT test, that, that kinetic test where in November they fired a missile and blew up a dead satellite, created a massive debris field. The astronauts on the International Space Station had to get into their spacecraft in case they needed to abandon the space station. Uh, recently, the White House came out and said, called for a ban of all of these destructive tests. So my question is, you know, uh, who's going to follow, and what teeth does that actually have? I mean, does that, or if tomorrow China blew up another satellite, what would the response be? Yeah, well, the Chinese did this in 2007, yeah. and uh, they created a debris field, so they shot down one of their satellites, I think it was a weather satellite, and created 2,000 plus pieces of orbital debris in the same in low Earth orbit in the same range that we fly a lot of satellites, but also where the space station is. I flew in 2008 as the commander of Discovery, and sure enough, we had to maneuver the space shuttle and space station. So flying the space shuttle to push the million plus pound, you know, manually out of the way of one of those pieces of junk um, that the Chinese created on that day. So they did it, the Russians did it, they, jet, they demonstrated they could. I don't expect this to be a routine thing because they have to deal with this debris field as well. The Russians in particular don't have a very good sense of where stuff is. Um, we often have to tell them, if we're not doing I, I doubt we're doing it now, but we used to tell them when they had a, some orbital uh, debris conjunction with some of their assets, not probably not their military assets, but you know maybe GLONASS or something like that, we would let them know because uh, we can detect debris down to about the size of a quarter. And we have a catalog and, and you get a trajectory on it, you know where it's gonna be, you check in with these thousands of objects uh, over and over again. So we have a real, really good sense. Now every so often we'll have something like a Russian rocket casing that was in orbit around the moon, and suddenly it could be in a, in a lunar Earth orbit. Um, so this is a big problem, and there's a big fear. There's this, uh, there's this guy out there, I can't remember his name, but he has this theory that we could wind up in a scenario where a piece of debris hits a satellite, creates more debris, that then hits another satellite, and this just kind of cascades until we wind up with a situation where low Earth orbit is unusable for I mean, not only for human spaceflight, but for satellites in general, that it just becomes a too crowded space and too dangerous. You think about the impact. I mean, the, the, the amount of economic impact that we do in space is about, worldwide, I think it's about $350 billion a year, but the economic impact that has on the ground is in excess of a trillion dollars. Yeah. So we don't want to get in that scenario. I don't expect them to routinely be shooting their own stuff down. They wanted to demonstrate that they could do it, for probably to send us, send us a message. Cleaning it up, really hard to do. There's some companies looking at doing that. I just don't see that that's a, a reasonable thing. Now, here's the good news. When you're talking about orbits between about 200 and 300 miles, where we put a lot, a lot of this stuff where the space station flies, over time, because of drag, there is some atmosphere there so because of drag, this stuff does come back to Earth. So as long as we're not increasing the, no, the amount of space junk, just naturally the amount of space junk will go down. I would just say very quickly, um, we can't unilaterally tie our hands because along with that call for a ban was also a unilateral decision to stop 
uh, ASAT testing, and it's some, you know, all ASAT testing or anti-satellite testing is not equal. Uh, the way the Russians and Chinese do it is, is quite reckless, uh, and they're creating thousands of pieces of debris the way the United States does it. The last one we did created less than 100, and it was in low Earth orbit, most of it. Uh, burned up. You can hit it from different angles. You can do it in a way that creates a uh, little debris. I, I, I think it speaks to this broader issue of if, if we are only nice enough and demonstrate good behavior, then our adversaries will follow. Uh, and I just don't think that's a model. We shouldn't be tying our own hands in, in this regard. And let me say our adversaries are also looking at <clears throat> other ways to do this, yep. not just launching the, you know, the, the, the missile from the surface of the Earth and kinetically killing the thing, uh, doing it in different ways. We, we understand what they're doing, and we will ultimately have to try to counter those methods. Yeah. So, so, Carrie, from the industry perspective, it's not just the debris. I mean, it's that, uh, say, SpaceX, for example, has more than 2,000 Starlink satellites on orbit. Amazon wants to put up several thousand uh, for this to beam the Internet down. Space is vast, but it's getting a little crowded up there. So I'm just wondering, from your perspective, how do you, how do you navigate all of that? Yeah, no, I mean, space is big, you're right. But I, I want to go back to what Congressman Walt said earlier, you know, that, that, that comment on we have gone down the path in our architectures of these big, fat, juicy targets. I think it was General Hyten that, that testified to your committee on that. Um, we've got to get away from that. So complementing what they're doing on the policy diplomatic front with no kidding, let's put some real investment on the table in terms of defense protection capabilities, but also diversifying and distributing the architecture, cybersecurity on the ground, because they're not just going to hit you in space. They potentially could be a lot more effective on the ground. So you need to have all of those pieces in place, not just the, the policy statements. Right. Um, 15 minutes or so to go. We have a lot of ground to cover, so I want, want to do a, maybe a little rapid fire, and I hate to ask a federal procurement question outside of Washington, D.C. It almost seems like a crime to ask a question like that in such a beautiful setting, but it's so important. Can the, the intelligence community, can the Pentagon harness this technology that's going on so fast in the commercial sector? Are we able to move fast enough, Senator Kelly? Uh, we had a uh, uh, so I'm the chairman of Emerging Threats and Capabilities. Joni Ernst is the ranking member. She just got up to get some coffee, I think. Um, <laughs> and so we were talking about this. We had a subcommittee hearing recently with all the, uh, the, the uh, defense, uh, the military labs, and DARPA, and the uh, head of research and development at DOD, you know, talking about this moving stuff from the private sector, this, you know, these really innovative companies that can move very fast and then getting this, these, you know, new technologies deployed as useful um, military hardware and methods. And um, there's this thing called the valley of death that a lot of the, this stuff that's, you know, works well in the, you know, the company's got a great product, but it's really hard to get it through the, the whole proc procurement process and it just kind of dies along the way. So we're trying to improve that and navigate that because we've got some really innovative folks out there, scientists and engineers, young people, and I think that's what China does not have. You know, they can graduate a lot of engineers. You know, they, can, they have a procurement process that's much more streamlined. You know, Xi Jinping can say, hey, I want this thing built, so you go ahead, give it to some company, you build this, and there's no request for proposal and there's no competitive bid Congress. bidding process. Yeah, yeah there you don't have to deal with Congress. They just go, go and do it. But I'll tell you what they don't have. They don't have the cre creativity. You know, they don't have what a, what a open democracy like ours produces from our education system. People willing to take risk, you know, to be innovative and creative uh, that doesn't care that maybe somebody in the government doesn't like what they happen to be working on and they decide to do it anyway. You know, that's something that China doesn't have, and that's what I think we really have to double down, as, double down on as a country. Yeah. I, I think General Raymond uh, with the Space Force, uh, the commander of the Space Force, is, has the right mindset and the right approach of public-private partnership, uh, trying, trying uh, to be more agile, as, as, the, as the senator said. I mean, taking into account, for example, there's a company uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, called Made in Space. They're putting 3D printers in space. 
that's how we get around the physics problem of, you know, how do you have a big enough rocket to get enough heavy stuff up there? Well, let's just get a 3D printer up there and start making it, or on the moon, and start making it and, integrate, uh, and integrating those technologies in. His, the long pole in his tent, the long pole in all of these companies' tent it, uh, are, are people. Uh, and we, we have a STEM problem here in the United States. We're due to be a million jobs short in STEM fields over the next decade. Uh, and, and it's a numbers issue. We have 11% of minorities participating, 25% of women uh, participating. I've worked on bipartisan legislation to get at that. But that's the, you know, that's the long pole right now in terms of, of integrating these technologies. And then just uh, because it's, we're going to have to wrestle with it, I see the chairman of Armed Services, uh, uh, Adam Smith, uh, sitting there is creating a, believe it or not, there's a Space National Guard uh, and a reserve. Um, and you may kind of shake your head at that, but bringing those private sector uh, ideas and thoughts in with members of the military who are, have a day job in these innovative companies, but then can put on a uniform and come into the service and innovate and, and, leap, and help them leap forward, I think is really important. And can, and so are I've you now, frustrated by it? Are you okay with the way it's going? And I've now seen it on both sides, government and industry, so I'll argue with myself. But <laughs> you know, one of the observations I'd make is if you go to those different, like the military services, the works, W-E-R-X, you go to one of their websites and you see over a thousand companies they brought into the fold and, and you know, a great statistic, all these new innovative small companies. Each of those companies are getting you know, a 10K contract, a 50K contract. I mean, it's meaningful, but when they've got to now go back to their investors who are providing private capital for them to do the development but then that the government can take advantage of, you can't go with a 10K contract. So the, back to the Valley of Death point is, of those over 1,000 companies, which ones are actually making it across? And I recognize not all of them are going to make it across. But you know, we've got to start now putting in some, some, some chips here for which are the ones that are really going to be meaningful and that we can scale. The other piece of it is that we're learning is you, know, you can't just throw a rock over the, the transom and expect a user to say, aha, that's exactly the rock I needed. There is this iteration loop that has to happen. You have to embed in with those users, those operators, get, really understand their problems so that you're, 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 you can polish your rock, you, know, you can fix it, but you can modify it so that it's better tailored to help meet their mission challenge. So uh, in about 2014, and I was covering uh, Senator McCain, and he came out strongly, real concerns about the RD-180 engines, which was used by the United Launch Alliance, the joint venture of Lockheed Martin and Boeing, which had the contracts to fly all the national security satellites, and they're using the RD-180, which is a Russian-made engine. And he saw around the corner that this was a problem, that we needed an American-made engine to be launching these satellites. And as a result of, of his work and his advocacy, we're moving away from that. But I wonder, does that say something about the American industrial base, that for so long we had been relying on Russia, not just on a civil partnership on the International Space Station, but on a crucial national security asset. And where are we now? Well, I think it's, I mean, we like cheap stuff. I mean, we like, you know, to buy the cheapest thing. And to sometimes to our detriment, those engines were cheap, and they, but they worked. Um, and we could get a lot of them. Uh, but it was, for our national security, it was a mistake to buy them. Uh, we've, thanks to Senator John McCain, We've sort of solved that, right? Uh, we've got other options now. Blue Origin has a, I think it's called the Vulcan engine. Um, they've got contracts. Uh, a lot of folks are lining up to buy that engine. I think, uh, I think ULA is as well. So we've worked through this, but it takes, uh, it takes somebody who can look over the horizon like John McCain did uh, when he did that in 2014 to fix this problem, but I think, I think we've addressed it. Yeah. I'll just say, it, as he looked over the horizon on the engine issue, we have to look over the horizon on all of our supply chains issue, issues. Mm. Uh, the, the, the dependencies that the Chinese Communist Party have deliberately created uh, in rare earths and lithium and cobalt and manganese and graphite, uh, and not to mention in, in, in chips, is just a, it's something that we're, we're struggling with in committee because it's not there. How do we create that market 
to bring that manufacturing back home? How do we incentivize it appropriately? Yeah. So I want to ask a question about the future of the International Space Station. This is a big issue. Uh, Russia is our partner there. We rely on them to provide propulsion for the ISS. As you were saying, Senator Kelly, if there's a piece of debris, it's Russia that has the capability to maneuver it, to, to dodge that piece of debris. Uh, the other day, uh, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson said he fully expects Russia to stay committed to the station till 2030. The White House wants to extend that partnership. Um, there's maybe some news about that this morning that we were looking at backstage. Are you confident that we, they will remain committed? Uh, and then the other question is, should we be in partnering with Russia on ISS, given everything that's going on in Ukraine right now? Well, I've been talking to uh, Senator Nelson and um, NASA Administrator Nelson and Pam Melroy, the Deputy Administrator, regularly about what's going on in Ukraine and how this is going to affect, at some point, it's going to affect our partnership with them on the, on the International Space Station. Uh, we, we continue in Congress, and I know the White House continues to look for options on sanctions. You know, what more can we do? Eventually, we will have done everything, and there'll be one thing left. And that's, we have this partnership in space on ISS with them that over the years has, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's generally worked, you know, pretty well, and our crew members work together. As you mentioned, they have uh, the, the ability to maneuver so because of the drag and the space station's a million pounds, it's the size of the football, football field, it loses altitude over time. And that Russian service module can be refueled and it can raise the apogee of the space station. So it can boost the orbit. Um, without that, we have a hard time. It's not impossible. We could do it with the Dragon, you know, the SpaceX uh, capsule. We could boost the space station. It would take some time to build that capability in. Uh, but what happened this morning is Dmitry Rogozin, the head of the Russian Space Agency, said that, he basically said, they're out and they will give NASA notification. Uh, and then it looks like what he, he meant to say, I'm, you know, it depends on how you read this, but it looks like what he meant to say is within a year they could actually be done. Now, ending that partnership is gonna be a challenging thing because you know, they operate the telemetry from the soup, which is the Russian Mission Control Center, goes to the service module. There's things operated that way. Um, so we are, it would be hard for either country to operate the ISS without the other country. Uh, we have the, a lot of the environmental system and the electrical system and the, and the control moment gyros to hold the attitude of the space station. So uh, I don't know where this leads. Uh, it might be even impossible to pull the pieces apart. They might be rusted together. Things do rust in space. Um, so they might be stuck together. So we, do, we don't know how this is going to unfold. Eventually, though, we do know that at some point, the International Space Station, at a million pounds, will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and crash into the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. And I will be there to see it. <laughs> do you want to comment on that, Congressman Maltz, and then we'll go to questions from Ten the Ten seconds. Yeah. I think it's always worth reminding ourselves of why the International Space Station is so important and why it's worth continuing to fund with, with, with your tax dollars. Uh, the amount of research that we are going to be able to conduct uh, and can, should continue to conduct in microgravity is, is just phenomenal. It's groundbreaking. It is uh, the private sector launch that just went up and the, the research that they are conducting on in the medical field, uh, in the manufacturing field, in, in microgravity. It's almost like you know, the days when we were just starting to do research with computers. We don't even know yet what we're going to be able to discover up there. And I, I'm certainly committed to find a way, if it's private, privatizing, the International Space Station, as if it's working with the private sector to put another low Earth orbit, orbit platform. But if we don't, uh, the Chinese will be the only uh, entity with their own space station, which they are building right now, uh, in low Earth orbit, and that's not acceptable. And right. I would add, you know, with this theme on strategic competition here, our space technology, our desire to tackle these hard problems, that is a competitive advantage for America. There are, I would observe, there are plenty of countries, allies and partners out there that want to work with us on space. Yeah. 
India, Japan, Korea, Middle Eastern partners, NATO allies. Um, so we have allies and partners out there that you know help help in this competitive. And if we don't have that platform, they're all forced then to go to the CCP for what they want to do. And there's some hope that the commercial sector will partner with some of those mm -hmm. countries who may not be partners on ISS. Yep. Okay, we've got a couple of people with uh, microphones. If anyone wants to ask a question, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll call on you. We'll do it, uh, I guess, elementary school style. I always tell people, please pose your question in the form of a question. I know there are sometimes at these conferences people want to go on. If not, I'll just keep going for the last couple of minutes because I don't see any hands. Somebody has to have a question. It's always hard to get the first one. We have one over here. There we go. And if you could also just identify yourself and uh, to whom your question is uh, directed. Sure. sure. My name is Maggie Feldman Pilch, um, and I'm the founder of NatSec Girl Squad. And um, a lot of the panelists this weekend have spoken about a STEM crisis or a STEAM crisis and a training crisis. Um, and I'm wondering if you all can talk a little bit about some of the other talent and retention challenges along the lines of security clearance reform um, and, and other things that aren't just about hard skills and maybe some other creative ways we can think about accessing government so service and mission-driven employment for people. I'm going to defer to my colleagues. Private sector colleagues. Oh, my. <laughs> uh, you know, it is incredibly challenging. Um, but, but I'll tell you, we've, we've been fortunate. Um, we've been able to get a great group of engineers, software developers, coders, testers um, that are just inspired by what they see happening in space. Um, and want, want to come work, uh, work in our industry and make a difference. Uh, but we do a lot of, uh, we do internship programs. Um, we've sought to reach out to um, a more diverse sector of universities, HBCUs, HSIs, Brooke Owens Fellowship, um, to bring folks in. We do a lot of the conferences and trade fairs because um, we, we want to spark that interest. And not just in the university level, but we want to spark that interest to that kindergartner, that first grader, or that that young Carrie that saw astronaut Kelly, you know, get selected for the core and fly up in space. So, I think there's a lot K through 12 in college that that um, companies are trying to do. I, I would just add. I mean, I have a STEM elementary school uh, in my district, and I drive all of these companies through that school uh, when they when they come see me. Uh, and these kids in fifth grade are doing CAD, and third grade are doing robotics competitions. We, so to, to answer, I think we have to start a lot sooner. Um, and then the other piece is not just STEM, it's, it's the wrench turning uh, and, and the technical skills as well. And I believe that's a broader societal question. It's okay if you don't go off to a four-year liberal arts school and, and get a degree in medieval literature or whatever. Um, that we have uh, a school uh, in, in Florida, Daytona State, that has just some amazing uh, uh, instruction on technical skills. And I think if we reemphasize that for a society, we'll be far better for it. Yeah, we need more scientists, we need more engineers, but we also need more teachers and nurses in our country like right now. And there's probably, you could probably add things to those lists, to that list. We need to uh, figure out better ways to help young people get the education they need and to afford it. Um, you know, just college and university is just often unaffordable for too many individuals. I think we really need to focus on what we need as a nation and put the resources there. I think that's a great way to end it. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. I want to say thank you to Senator Kelly, Congressman Walton, Kerry, and thanks to all of you thank for you. coming. Really appreciate it.